I really want to extend a special um, warm, though the weather doesn't reflect it, welcome to uh, Lisa Makina, who's uh, with us from the University of Turku in, in Finland. She's in the uh, Department of Geography there. Um, and uh, uh, Val, who I co-lead the Equality Project with, uh, and I have uh, know uh, Lisa and her work through um, Surveillance and Society uh, Network, um, and uh, she's done a lot of really interesting work and we're really proud to have her now as a collaborator um, on the Equality Project uh, as well. Um, for today her discussion is uh, Can They See Me Now? Examining the Surveyed Subject and Surveillance Experience. So I'm going to turn it over to Lisa. Thanks very Thank much. You. Thank you Jane uh, and good morning to you all or good day I think I might say uh, and thank you for this opportunity to get to speak here today at the University of Orava. So um, I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Turku, as uh, Jane said, and visiting here for a month in the Equality Project. My own background is in social sciences. I have a PhD from social and public policy. And in my uh, PhD thesis, I examined private uses of surveillance technology in everyday life. And I analyzed how those uses set uh, between frameworks of control and play. And I'm currently working in the geography department. Uh, we have just started a four-year research project there where we uh, aim to investigate subjective surveillance experiences with a special focus on young people, where it's also where my collaboration with the Equality Project is set. And uh, personal or individual experiences of surveillance is also what I want to talk to you today about. In my PhD thesis, I built on the view that surveillance particularly in the context of everyday life activities, it cannot be conceptualized merely in the framework of control, as there are obviously many examples of people using surveillance equipment for purposes of uh, fun or pleasure or passing the time. And I analyzed how the framework of play could be uh, offered as an alternative to control, or how uh, the private surveillance practices move uh, between and beyond these two frames. And today my aim is to give you an sort of an overall tour or, or an introduction of what it can mean to be under surveillance, both in the context of control and play and other contexts as well. And in doing this I use both my own research and research made by other people. At the end of my talk I suggest an analytical framework uh, um, which, we, which we could maybe use to help us to begin to understand and analyze those experiences in more detail. I begin with a short story. Uh, this was something that happened to me a few years ago when I was still working on my PhD thesis. Um, it was a lazy Sunday morning. Uh, I was taking a stroll through my home neighborhood in Helsinki. Um, I had no plans for the day. I had nothing special to do. I was just walking around, enjoying the sun and enjoying my day off. In the middle of my walk, I noticed these four young boys, maybe 10 years old or something like that. They were running around and pushing each other and playing, doing what kids do at that age. And then suddenly one of them stopped and asked that the others would stop too. They were standing in front of this building. It was actually one of the university buildings. Um, and they were in front of a door which had a surveillance camera on top of the door um, pointing at people who were entering and exiting the building. And one of the boys tiptoed to the door, um, stopped in front of it, paused and started to stare at the surveillance camera. And he stood there still for, a, for a, several seconds staring at the camera. And I had paused as well or I was trying to walk as slowly as I could without seeming weird. <laughs> I was intrigued to see what would happen. Um, and then the boy, um, he reached into his pocket and took his hand out, mimicking a gun. And then he placed the gun to his temple and he pulled the trigger and fell to the ground as if he was dead. And the other boy stood there, also silent, staring at him, wondering what was going on here. And then the uh, boy uh, got up um, and all of them started laughing and then they ran away. And I was standing there with my mouth open at what had just happened. <laughs> and I found this event really inspiring at the time, and still I find it inspiring in my own research on how surveillance is perceived and dealt with uh, by different people, in different surroundings, uh, in different situations, 
um, and how those personal reactions to being monitored can be quite different than what might have been intended by those uh, installing or operating the surveillance equipment. Uh, before I move forward with this idea, I think I should briefly define what I mean with surveillance. This is probably quite familiar to most of you, but just in case. And briefly, um, as a research concept, surveillance has traditionally been defined as a top-down control mechanism. Control has been and still is an important framework in surveillance research. Here are two well-known definitions by David Lyon, uh, a professor emeritus nowadays from Queen's University, um, who has uh, framed surveillance as any collection and processing of personal data for the purposes of influencing or managing those whose data have been garnered. Now, there is an ongoing debate in surveillance studies field um, on how surveillance should be defined. And this debate has gained momentum in the past decade or so, as scholars have started to increasingly pay attention to these sort of playful sides of surveillance, rather than focusing merely on its controlling aspects. And examining these playful sides includes uh, examining themes such as um, the use of social media platforms, or analyzing surveillance and reality TV, or fiction, or games or recognizing the potentially playful uses of uh, surveillance technology, such as home surveillance cameras, which I will talk about later in this lecture, or uh, facial recognition software. And when we examine these types of data gathering, we also need to widen what it is that we understand with surveillance. And indeed, in 2014, David Lyon uh, changed his his definition of surveillance um, and argued that surveillance itself has changed into an everyday life social experience from a serious security issue to an incessant demand for data from numerous organizations to a playful path of mediated relationships. And in this talk I follow along these lines and in my uh, own research in more general um, and um, use surveillance as a shorthand term to describe an everyday life a social process where personal details are collected or focused attention is paid to them for various purposes. In the field of surveillance studies, there is much research on themes such as privacy, police, security, borders, terrorism, drones, body-worn cameras, yeah, things like that. Uh, but a lot less research, in my opinion, focuses on the everyday life monitoring practices, uh, the mundane experiences and feelings of being uh, watched, of using surveillance, of being the target of information gathering. And as researchers, in my view, we still know surprisingly little about average people and their mundane monitoring practices. And this is where my own research interests at the moment lie. So my talk today is structured as follows. Uh, I'll continue through framing the experience of being under surveillance, aiming to dig through the uh, various modes or purposes or contexts or frameworks of uh, surveillance and how they might influence the experience uh, of surveillance. Mm. I will consider the subject of surveillance uh, in regards to each of them and draw the notes together at approximately halfway through this lecture, maybe a little more than halfway through. Um, and then I will move on to presenting my own findings from uh, an em empirical data I gathered a few years back on uh, home surveillance system users. And finally, I'll conclude with a suggestion uh, for future research and present a framework that we maybe could use uh, when analyzing these experiences in the future. Um, so if we are to understand the experience of being under surveillance, uh, we first need to understand the nature and purpose of conducting surveillance in uh, different situations, and then examine possible reactions to that surveillance uh, in those specific contexts. For instance, in the story I just told you about the four young boys, uh, the surveillance camera in the wall of that building obviously had one main purpose, to control and track who enters and exits the building. However, for the boys, the camera was a toy, it was a gadget in their merrymaking, and the scene that the boy played out was reminiscent of a number of movies or TV series or such. Um, think, for instance, Jack Bauer in the TV series 24, a few years back, uh, talking to his colleagues on the phone, looking at them through the camera. 
obviously his he couldn't see his colleagues, but his colleagues could see him. I, I actually have a vague memory of seeing this scene in the show. Uh, but my point is that the way we react to surveillance around us, particularly camera surveillance, uh, already from a very young, young child, is influenced by popular culture, uh, by movies, and by our constant exposure to cameras and, and recording devices in our everyday life. I have a nine-month-old daughter who loves taking selfies. Whenever I get my phone out, for whatever reason, she starts smiling. So there is this uh, desire to be seen and this fascination in being recorded and, and interested in, interest in all these kinds of gadgets already from a very young age. And while we can act in unexpected ways when under surveillance, um, I believe that there are some main dynamics that can be found um, in that experience and yeah, that behavior. So I want to walk you through some of the frameworks and and drawing from previous research and my own research, consider what the personal experience could look like. And I'll begin with this framework of control, as it is the uh, foundation where we build upon uh, when examining surveillance. And in a way, uh, this is also the, the easiest uh, approach to surveillance. So analyzing situations where information on us is uh, collected for the purpose of controlling or managing our uh, actions or behavior. And obviously examples of this type of surveillance range from, uh, for instance, denying or granting access at international borders or tracking our um, address information via our car's register plate and sending a ticket for speeding to our home or uh, determining eligibility for social benefits, for instance. So the examples are numerous on this type of surveillance. And in many cases, the individual does not have a choice uh, whether or not they want to be surveilled. It is, this kind of surveillance is often implemented by the state, um, and in many cases it is justified by security reasons. And this is also the domain where you most often hear the argument that if you have nothing to uh, hide, you have nothing to fear, which has obviously been proven false in many researches. Um, John Chilliom, for instance, has done fascinating research on welfare uh, mothers and welfare surveillance in Ohio, uh, U USA, and he has examined the high level of uh, uh, surveillance and tracking the mothers are subjected to when they apply for these benefits, and their manners of coping with that surveillance. And he concludes that the high level of scrutiny that the mothers are imposed on um, turns them into diminished people who are fearful uh, and careful not to do anything which might make them lose their benefits. For instance, uh, Gilliam describes that if the mothers are treated poorly by the system of, or if they experience some kind of injustice, they might complain to their peers, but they rarely make any formal complaints as it might draw unwanted attention to them and their situation and further endanger their situation. So in Gilliam's research, um, the experience of being under surveillance uh, in, with these mothers, it doesn't set in the framework of losing one's privacy, for instance, which you might think as they need to give out um, so much of their personal data. But he describes an experience with ha which has more to do with uh, feelings of fear, of shame, of insecurity, uh, even degradation. Um, and as such, his research also touches one of the main characteristics uh, in this framework of surveillance, and that is the risk and fear talk that is associated with it. Uh, Frank Furedi has analyzed present-day society as a risk-saturated culture of fear, and he argues that in this culture, safety is a fundamental value, and risk is something that needs to be avoided. And one consequence of the increasing emphasis on risk uh, and fear is that people have become more security conscious. Uh, and focus on public fears calls for more security, containing um, the danger and identifying and managing any and all kinds of risks. And surveillance technologies obviously seem well suited for these purposes. So accordingly, he argues that surveillance technologies and their extensive use has become commonplace. Uh, and what is particular about risk in present day society is that it's not only uh, geared towards individuals, but it is generalized. Uh, which means that participation is required at every level. So beyond protecting oneself, um, if you are uh, security conscious, you should also participate in shared control. 
Uh, thus, this fear and notions of risks can also be exploited by, for instance, the authorities, uh, who can use the threat of risk as an incentive um, for people to participate in shared monitoring. So, what do you think? What kind of subjectivity is formed under controlling surveillance? Here are a few examples from uh, previous research. Now, uh, Furedi, like Gilliam, as I described, uh, analyzes the subject of surveillance as a diminished subject, so a risk-conscious individual. And he argues that in this climate of risk, individuals feel exposed and unsafe. And this experience makes them preoccupied with personal safety. And as a result, they try to avoid unnecessary risks and play it safe. Uh, on similar lines, Torin Monahan argues uh, that the ideal citizen of the present day is constructed as an insecurity subject, a person who anticipates risks and minimizes them through consumption. So like the diminished subject, the insecurity subject is afraid but can effectively, effectively sublimate those uh, fears by engaging in preparedness activities. So by consuming, uh, buying safety-related equipment, they can improve their own situation. And thirdly, Hille Koskela, among others, um, analyzes individuals uh, participating in shared control by viewing them as uh, humble servants of authoritarian control, as workforce executing policies dictated from above. And this view also gives little credit to the autonomy of the participant diminishing them to the role of employees of the state, or puppets, as in the picture. Um, so here are a few examples of how the surveilled subject has been conceptualized in previous research. But let's move on with the frameworks and see what other subjectivities we can find. Um, Another important framework for analyzing surveillance is care, and this brings out the two-sided nature of surveillance, as to surveil something can mean to watch over it or guard it. Um, so the target of this kind of caring surveillance is somehow fragile, in need of monitoring, uh, somehow of diminished ca capability to decide for him or herself, and the monitoring is done in his or her own good. Um, and the experience of being under this kind of caring surveillance is already at the core completely different than being under controlling surveillance. Think of a child being watched over by um, her parents or an elderly person being monitored by their adult uh, son. So the discursive meaning produced differ um, than, for instance, if the one watched was a babysitter taking care of a child or a teenager hanging with her or his friends. And the experience for the watcher, watched would uh, significantly differ too, I would argue. And obviously the interesting point for discussion is when we, close the, uh, close the, when we are closing the margins of being able to take care of oneself. Uh, for instance, at what age is a child too old um, to be monitored for their own safety? Can a parent uh, justify going through their teenager's phone records, for instance, in the name of care? Uh, I will speak more about monitoring next of kin at the end when I uh, introduce my own research on home surveillance systems, but I wa want to briefly mention this uh, intriguing article I read, uh, written by a Finnish sociologist, Inka Lähteenaro, on how various smart home systems can be used to track and guide behavior of family members online and remotely. So uh, there seems to be a lot of talk nowadays about the data protection of house items which are connected to the Internet of Things. Uh, but there is, uh, in my view, a lot less talk about the consequences of family members uh, being able to gather and monitor data on, for instance, energy consumption and individual movements inside the house. In Lähteenaro's research, this data uh, was used, for instance, to monitor if the um, kids had taken the family dog out for a sufficiently long time, um, or if they had turned the lights off when they left the house. And furthermore, the possibility to remotely access the home's uh, electricity system was used to turn off the electricity at certain times so that the children couldn't use their computer anymore. So obviously these kind of uses operate on another register than caring surveillance, they're more about managing the children's behavior um, or checking up on them. But this also, in my view, goes to show how difficult it can be to draw the line 
uh, when this te technology enables all kinds of forms of control. And it also makes it difficult to uh, assess the personal experience of the one monitored through this technology. Um, Alongside the sort of traditional frameworks of control and care, I want to position surveillance for uh, commercial purposes, which is obviously a vast and a growing field. So collecting and tracking personal details for marketing and selling purposes seems to be, at least in my own life, at the forefront of my daily life in surveillance society. And with this framework, we can begin an interesting discussion as to how much uh, of the data gathered on us as consumers can in fact uh, improve our consuming experience and in a way make us desire more surveillance. Of course the system gets wrong all the time as anyone using Netflix's or Spotify's recommendation algorithms know. But in theory for an individual consumer the data gathering on previous activities might uh, might present a, a helpful, although sometimes a bit creepy, feature. Um, and, but there is also another side to this. Um, when my daughter was born, it took maybe three weeks for me to start getting mail from uh, diaper companies, um, baby photographers and such, aiming to sell me products as a mother of a newborn. Um, they had gotten the information on our child from the Population Register Center in Finland. And I got irritated really quickly, um, and I notified the Population Register Center that they cannot give out my information anymore for these kinds of purposes. And after that, it took maybe two weeks uh, before the mail started coming in with my partner's name on it. <coughs> um, and for me personally, as an individual, as a consumer, the problem is that I don't want targeted advertising. I don't want someone else to decide for me what I what I need or what I could want. I want to see what is, uh, what is there to offer and then uh, decide what I want. And actually it would be interesting in hearing your uh, experiences of targeting advertising, your feelings of being the target of information gathering for purposes of selling you more things. This is perhaps one of the things we can discuss then at the end of this talk. Um, and obviously, besides using information gathered from public sources, a lot of the information used for marketing purposes is information we ourselves willingly give out. Uh, for instance, through various self-surveillance applications, um, which then again can make us want to consume more. Uh, there was this interesting research by uh, Carl Palmos, a Swedish sociologist. He conducted a small-scale ethnographic study um, on a community of windsurfers that use GPS technology uh, to monitor and share their own performance online. And when he began doing his study, he had this idea that um, being able to track their own performance in that sport would boost narcissism and boost discipline among the uh, windsurfers. But however, after conducting his research, he noticed that above all, the ability to track down their own performance through these devices made them want to buy better devices and buy more devices so that they could get more accurate measurements. Uh, and this is just an example of how consumer culture can creep through uh, to unexpected places. Mm, in a similar manner as surveillance and marketing are tied up together, so is surveillance and being social nowadays, obviously. Uh, and this is our next framework. Um, and this is also where it gets tricky, uh, as the places where we are online, uh, where we are social online, uh, are obviously also the places where much of the information uh, gathering on us takes place. But on the individual level, the experience is uh, likely one of socializing or hanging out with friends, uh, not of being surveilled. And also in this framework, we move increasingly towards private uses of surveillance, uh, uh, surveillance technology, where controlling surveillance and caring and even commercial surveillance are often set at vertical levels, where the, um, someone is watching from above and the target of the information gathering is uh, below. But however, much of our everyday life, daily monitoring practices uh, take place horizontally, and we are at the same time uh, watchers and watched or gathering information and information on us is gathered at the same time. Um, Ariane Ellebrock, who is a uh, Albertan researcher, 
has examined Facebook as a classic example of a technology of multiple variable visibility. So that is technologies that render individuals visible to diverse interests simultaneously via the corporate ownership of intimate personal data. And she argues that in the context of these uh, technologies, visibilities facilitate combined experience of empowerment and disempowerment. For instance, uh, in Facebook, uh, we and the information we post online is visible to our peers, to third parties aiming to market something to us, uh, to law enforcement agencies, and to any potential use which might be developed in the future. So this means that while for the individual user, the experience of using social media might be rewarding, might be empowering, in that they get to use, uh, use it as they wish, they get to share what they choose, uh, curate their identities as they choose fit, but at the same time it can be exploitative, uh, and information on them can be collected and stored and used then later on for purposes uh, which they did not originally mean it to be used. Um, and this also leads us to the next framework, which I've termed fun, play and games. Um, now, Mark Andrievic has analyzed lateral surveillance as monitoring which targets uh, family and friends and also casual acquaintances and romantic interests. So lateral surveillance is a form of surveillance born out of curiosity. It's this sort of casual monitoring uh, executed when whiling away the time online. Now, I think it's safe to say that we all know this type of uh, surveillance. You have nothing to do online and you start digging. What is your high school sweetheart doing nowadays? Does your neighbor have an online profile? Who is your best friend's new girlfriend? Um, so these are examples of things we can find out online if we have time, if we have nothing else to do. Um, and in the title I have termed this fun play and games, but often it's not that much fun, to be honest. It's just something we do as there is nothing else to do. It's fun born out of boredom and the fact that the technology enables us to do it. Um, however, obviously many ICT developers um, have also tried to tap to this fun and entertainment idea in their design, which have uh, led to gamification of various self-surveillance applications in particular. So self-surveillance, meaning the gathering of uh, data on oneself, for instance, regarding exercise habits, uh, sleeping, eating, and such. It's often done in apps where the feature, uh, which have features such as leaderboard, um, rewards for achieving preset goals, possibilities to share the results online among friends or even publicly. So there are some interesting questions around subjectivity forming here. Yes, is the data gathered and shared somehow uh, curated? Do we only post desired data? something that presents us in a positive light. Uh, does this tracking and changing, um, uh, sharing change our exercise habits, for instance, and so on. Um, so now, after this brief walk um, around some of the contexts where surveillance takes place, and these are just a few uh, as an introduction to you, so how can we begin to draw together the experience of being surveilled? And at this point, I suggest uh, that we could focus on three points of that experience for examination. Um, and the first would be to look at the experience of being monitored, of uh, being watched, of being the target of information gathering. So to examine the perceptions and experiences and understandings at the moment of data gathering. Do we notice that data gathering is taking place? Do we know who is gathering the data and for what purpose? Do we know what is done with the data? Um, second, we could examine the experience of the data gathering process. How is the information regarding us gathered and what type of data is gathered? For instance, is it biometric data, uh, visual data, data on movements? What kind of a data is it? Um, is the information gathered accurate? Is the gathering process just and fair? Can we influence the process somehow? And third, we could analyze the experience of the outcome of the information gathering. So what effect does the data gathering have on me personally? What can I gain from it? Uh, what do I risk of losing because of it? And we also must remember that the effect can be noticeable only after time, which makes it quite difficult to analyze. 
So do we know where the data is stored for and for how long? Um, now, after walking through these uh, various frameworks, what kind of a target of surveillance do we have in mind? So what does the surveillance subject look like? Um, I've gathered here, based on these frameworks we just went through, some potential subjectivities or positions given to the surveilled subject. And if you still remember the three uh, subjectivities I presented in the beginning, which were uh, diminished subject and insecurity subject and <coughs> humble servant, we can see that the picture already from this brief presentation that is formed um, is actually considerably wider and more colorful than presented in those three uh, subjective positions. So we have the fearful and afraid individual, um, docile or sympathetic towards surveillance, ignorant, not caring about it, uh, being active and participating in it, either because they are afraid or for some other reason, uh, fragile or of uh, diminished uh, capacity to take care of themselves, wanting to be monitored because of that, being empowered, uh, being critical or resisting surveillance in some ways, bored, uh, using surveillance for practical purposes or understanding the practicality behind many of the devices. And this last, um, we didn't actually even touch upon yet, so the uh, desire to be seen, desire to show oneself or create online identities for oneself. But in regards to this, I think we also need to remember that the desire to be seen is not necessarily the same as the desire to be recognized which is also an important separation. Mm, I wanted to collect this all here to illustrate how the experience of being under surveillance can vary considerably depending on the context of uh, information gathering and on the person uh, upon who the information is gathered and their own manners of dealing with it. And it seems to me that for surveillance scholars, myself included, we often view those who are participating in surveillance activities, or those who give out information on themselves uh, to surveillance-related applications, that they are somehow ignorant or naive as they willingly use systems uh, which can potentially exploit them. And this view gives quite little credit to the, these people. And based on my own research, which I will move on to next, uh, the users of surveillance technologies are not ignorant. Um, they often choose to use the technologies despite their uncertainties, and they in fact often are active and informed agents, um, aware of the potential risks related to these devices and managing those risks to the best of their uh, knowledge. And I think further research is still needed to fully grasp the complex dynamic of using uh, surveillance-enabling devices, but at the same time being critical or wary of them. Um, now for the remainder of this uh, lecture, I want to focus on my own research and on data I gathered a few years ago as part of my PhD thesis. And this data collected comprises of 13 exploratory interviews conducted in Finland uh, with people who have installed surveillance systems in their own homes, uh, or in two cases their secondary place of residence. And with this data, I wanted to find out what people do with their home surveillance systems meaning how they use them, um, what their experience of surveillance in the context of their own home is. <clears throat> so I interviewed 13 people in total. Here you can see the age and sex of the interviewees. Uh, they were between ages 36 and 70, uh, with an average age of 58, so quite on the senior side uh, of, of age. Um, uh, five were female and eight were male. Uh, they were asked, ab asked about three themes. Uh, firstly, uh, their home and the neighborhood. So what kind of house do they live in? Who lives there? What is the neighborhood like? And so on. Uh, second, there's their surveillance system. So what kind of system they have? Uh, why was it installed? How do they use it? And so on. And third, their feelings towards surveillance in general and particularly in inside their homes. Uh, the interviews were recruited through shared friends, uh, snowball sampling, and uh, through an online discussion forum discussing surveillance systems. 
Uh, and based on the type of system used, uh, these interviews can be divided into two similar sized groups. Uh, the first group, group of seven, is those who had varying types of systems, predominantly uh, based on camera surveillance in their homes or secondary places of residence. So these systems had either one or multiple cameras filming these locations, and the residents themselves could uh, see the feed from these cameras, either online from their computers or through mobile applications. The feed was not routed through a security company, but they could see it themselves. And most of these systems included a motion detector, which if it was set off, alerted the resident's mobile phone, and they could then see what was going on. Uh, the other half of these uh, interviews, six people in total, had a system based on access control. So these systems um, contained intruder detection methods such as glass break detectors, infrared detectors, cameras with motion sensors, and so on. And most of these systems were connected to a security company, um, and they included a camera which the company could access, but the residents themselves couldn't access that camera. And if an alarm would go off, the company would access the camera and see what was going on and try to reach the resident, and then if none of these were useful, then they would send security guards to the house to assess the situation. Um, I will now briefly introduce the results on what people did with these uh, systems, and then after that focus a bit more on their experiences of being monitored uh, at their own home and their thoughts of being able to watch their own family members with this technology. But first, what did they do with these systems? Uh, so I have divided these uses into four categories and begin with this controlling uh, kind of uses. So obviously the primary reason why people installed, installed a home surveillance system was to protect the home and the residents from unwanted visitors. So installing home surveillance equipment demonstrates the residents' desire not only that their home provides um, protection from outside world by preventing unauthorized access, but also that it safeguards the sense of mental well-being, that if something were to happen in their home, um, with the help of these systems, they would be warned, warned and they could act accordingly. So here are a few quotes. Uh, with the system, you can get an assurance that no one unknown has pervaded your home. No one has broken anything. You can feel positive. In a way, you are home, even if you are not. I know that if there is something happening at home, I can call the police and tell them that this is the situation now. Uh, give them a description of the burglars. However, there were only a few cases when uh, the camera had recorded someone unknown in the premises, and in none of these cases uh, had anyone actually attempted to enter the residence without invitation. What have you seen through the camera? Empty yard, and a few times the mailman has come with a package to see if anyone's home, but that's it, nothing else. So it seems that when looking at the actual uses of these systems, there isn't much going on in the interviewees' houses. And perhaps that was one of the reasons why people started to um, invent new uses for their systems. So in fact, this type of controlling surveillance was most visible in the signs people had um, glued to their doors and fences warning about the system. And the signs warning about surveillance in these premises uh, operated as a sort of border control, where the aim was to separate the outside, which was seen as dangerous, and the inside, which was seen as pure. And control took place on the border of these two domains. And those signs created a barricade, which was hoped to prevent unauthorized access. Uh, second, the cameras were used to monitor next of kin, especially small children, which formed as caring surveillance. And in many cases this was possible because the cameras were light and wireless and easy to move around from one place to the other. And these quotes uh, describe how the systems were used both as uh, upscale baby monitors and for making sure that the child had gotten safe home from school. Uh, so the secondary task of the, of the system is that we have this big house, we are babysitting a small child who sleeps far away in the house, so we take the camera to her cradle and we can do our chores at the other end of the house and see if she has waken up. Um, at that time my son was in the first grade in elementary school, due to circumstances was forced to come home alone. Um, and that was one of the reasons for the camera. 
so that I could see that he has come home and that he is there safe. Um, besides these two uses, uh, care-related usages also included monitoring adult family members who were doing something potentially dangerous, uh, such as chopping wood outside on the yard, uh, and also watching domestic animals. Uh, here is a quote, I won't read this to you, uh, from one of the interviews. A middle-aged woman uh, who used the camera mainly to check on her dog during her uh, working hours. So she had live feed on from her apartment on her computer desktop all the time and she could see her dog moving in the apartment, barking at the mailman and sleeping. In addition to monitoring for control or care, uh, it was not uncommon to use the cameras for playful or social purposes or merely to pass the time. So the cameras were used, for instance, to observe nature, wildlife, weather, and other scenes merely for entertainment purposes. Um, it's not that uncommon that every now and then a bigger animal moves in our neighborhood. If that would happen, say a wolf would walk through our yard, I could prove it to others that I'm not crazy or anything. It's actually possible to have a wolf walk around one's yard. <laughs> Uh, I move the camera around, sometimes it films the shed outside, sometimes it films birds nesting. When we are at home it has no use. There is one family of minks who always take the same route when walking through the yard, and I always check if they have walked through there again. Okay. Uh, fourthly, the cameras were used as a tool in aiding communication between family members. And these uses uh, included relying on the system to automatically notify family members when someone arrived home or to the secondary residence, uh, using the cameras to signal from outside to inside, or monitoring family members when they were doing their chores and using that information to instruct them. Uh, the screen is on the kitchen table, and you can check it, uh, check from it what is happening in the yard. And we often we have this sauna near the main building. So if you are there at the sauna, heating it up, uh, and it's ready, you don't have to call out to someone at the main building. You can just wave at the camera, and they can see it from the inside. So obviously the man is warming up the sauna, and the woman is inside in the kitchen looking at the camera. <clears throat> My son lives near our house, and we have agreed that when we're abroad, he'll water our plants. The camera upstairs sending, uh, sends an alarm to me to my mobile phone when someone is climbing up the stairs. So I can watch him water the plants, and I can even call him straight away to remind him not to forget the furthest plant. Uh, Gavin Smith, an Australian researcher, uh, analyzes CCTV technologies as social mediums where people being watched are not mere objects of information, but subjects of communication. And by arguing that CCTV technologies facilitate social relations, he contests the common notion uh, that watchers are active and empowered agents and the watched are passive objects. And in the context of home surveillance systems, uh, this disti distinction between user and target of watcher and watched is further blurred, as both can be beneficiaries of the system at the same time. So like other CCTV technologies, home uh, surveillance systems can be used as social platforms, uh, which facilitate two-way communication between residents. Here's a quote from a man um, whose son was home alone during the afternoons. It was actually funny that my son understood that I was watching him through the camera, and whenever he walked past it, he remembered to greet me and wave at the camera. Um, so as you can see from these few quotes that I have showed here, um, home surveillance cameras offer people the possibility to watch. Um, at the same time, the, they do enable surveillance at a distance. And now, after briefly describing the uses of these systems, I want to turn to situations uh, when the residents turn the cameras off at their homes. So when I began doing this research, uh, the main questions I had were formed originally around the individuals who are conducting uh, surveillance in their premises. So I was interested in the watcher, wanted to find out how and why they executed surveillance in their homes, what their experience of surveillance was in that context. But however, when I was conducting the interviews and when I started analyzing them, uh, I found that the most intriguing questions 
um, rose around the feelings people described uh, when they felt watched in their own home or when they were questioned in their role as the watcher in, in their homes. So installing and operating this surveillance equipment was by no means insignificant to many of the occupants. And they had ambivalent feelings uh, towards their systems and they had varying way, ways of uh, um, mitigating the potential exposure uh, of themselves and of their families uh, to the gaze of the camera. And many of the interviewees were concerned that the feed or the records of the cameras placed in their homes would be accessed by unauthorized person. They, and they managed this concern by either placing the cameras in a manner that nothing too private would be disclosed. For instance, um, they placed them so that they filmed the hallway or living room or such, uh, never the bedroom, never the toilet or shower or something like that. And furthermore, many reported that uh, they took the system offline when they went home and they usually enforced this by pulling the plug from the socket so that there would be absolutely no way the camera could film them when they were home. Here are a few quotes on that. And I always have the feeling that the camera is watching me. Luckily, there isn't a LED light on top of the uh, camera. Uh, if there were, I might get a bit paranoid. And I always turn the system off when I am at home. Why? Because I have this nasty feeling that someone can hack into it or something. It's horrid to have this feeling that someone is following you through the camera when you're home. Well, we did have some discussions with my wife when installing the camera. She was a bit frightened about the purpose of this camera and worried if someone could see something through it. But we decided to trust the information security provided here. And the camera is located in a place that is, well, it's not for instance the shower or anything like that. So it probably wouldn't be that awkward, meaning if someone could access the feed. But yes, I must admit thinking that now I have a camera in my own home connected all the time, it does make me wonder and I have contacted the supplier of the system and asked for a feature that would make the system easier to turn off. <coughs> and I found it really interesting how these systems uh, create a paradoxical situation in relation to exposure. These systems claim to protect the resident from exposure to the outside world uh, in that they claim to prevent outsiders from entering the premises because of these systems. But at the same time, uh, they expose the resident to an unwanted gaze uh, by including a Wi-Fi linked camera on the system. And this in part created um, an ambivalent feeling towards surveillance among the residents. Um, there were also some interesting results in terms of the interviewees being the surveyor, surveillors of and in their own homes. Mm, as watchers in their own homes, the residents positioned themselves in accordance to an ideal of integrity. So even though a camera at home could quite easily be used for spying on family members, it seems these uses were explicitly avoided uh, among my interviewees. So the system's potential for spying was uh, recognized and discussed in several interviews, and many argued that they do not operate their systems in this manner. And the interviewees positioned themselves above spies and warriors. Now we obviously must remember that this is a delicate subject. It is not at all sure that the interviewees would feel comfortable in, in uh, telling me that yes, I do spy on my spouse. Um, and also previous research has shown how uh, harassment via these kind of smart home solutions is a uh, growing concern. However, as I did have uh, long discussions about this issue, um, with the interviews, and it seemed that they had really given a lot of thought to this theme and their own responsibility as watchers. Here are a few quotes on this theme. I'm really meticulous in that I have no camera which, for instance, would film my wife indoors. When we leave the country, I turn the camera so that it films the entire living room and the stairs going up. But when we are here, and if someone is inside the house, then definitely not. When my adult son is there with his family or with their friends, I obviously do not watch the feed. They know that it is filming all the time, but I do not look at the feed until they notify me that they have left the place. I hate that the system has that microphone. I'm not interested in eavesdropping anyone. I feel that the current feature of the system in my use step too far in the area of spying. The instances when these systems were kept on, even if someone was in the house, uh, was when children were home by themselves. 
But however, even while these systems were used to monitor children, uh, they were not used to spy on them, or at least these uses were sort of frowned upon. Um, and this means that the monitoring in these cases uh, did not happen without the child being aware that, they are th that he or she is watched, uh, or without consideration of the feelings that the sort of unknown surveillance imposed upon, uh, upon the children could awake. Uh, one man I interviewed explained how he uses the camera to check on his son, who is home alone, uh, with his friends, um, and keeps an eye on, he keeps an eye on the boys through the cameras. And he explained to me that when he has watched the boys through the camera, the kind of situation hasn't come along yet, uh, that he would have had to call home and ask the boys, that they, uh, tell them that they can't do something that they are doing. And actually he's been trying to avoid that, si that situation, because he doesn't want to impose the feeling on his son. Uh, that his dad is stalking him through the camera. He deliberately hasn't wanted to give the boy the feeling that he is surveilled. Uh, so the residents I interviewed um, held the use of their systems up to a principle of integrity, um, and they were troubled if their motives as watchers were questioned. For instance, if visitors they had were concerned that they might be filmed when they were in the house. Um, and in the residents' own views, they used their system with honest purposes, and even to suggest that something uh, suspicious might be going on, evoked feelings of annoyance among them. One man described it like this. Some guests we have, when they come to our place, they say that, please don't use the images in the wrong way. And they ask whether or not they can go to the sauna, because I have these cameras. I tell them that the cameras are not there, they have been switched off, it is a bit unpleasant thing for me. I always tell them that they will not be filmed in their bathrobes, <laughs> or if they are there with or without a towel, that we will not be filming those who go to the beach, that the cameras are turned off now. So concluding on this section, it seems that being under surveillance, especially in the privacy of one's own home, can evoke positive and negative feelings simultaneously. And as a consequence of surveillance, the residents uh, might feel safe and protected, but at the same time, they might be annoyed or fearful uh, of the thought that they might be watched without their knowledge. And the unease regarding this technology is especially due to the nature of home as a private place. Um, and these systems are installed, and, uh, installed to protect the home as a private place, but since it is such a place, the idea of unwilling exposure is ever more troubling. And even though the residents have consciously chosen to implement surveillance technologies in their homes, um, they want to regulate potential exposure to monitoring and consequently manage their systems in a sincere manner. And this empirical research highlights domestic surveillance as a mix of conflicting issues relating to protecting one's property or subjecting oneself to monitoring, um, feeling safe or feeling exposed, um, communicating with loved ones or being suspected of spying on them, um, enjoying the possibility to watch or detesting the possibility that someone unauthorized could be watching. And these contradictions, in my view, form the essence of the paradox that is actually domestic surveillance. And they also show that the common usage of these systems do not remove the hesitation, even those who choose them can feel towards them. So, to conclude this lecture, I think I still have ample time. Um, I want to suggest a preliminary uh, and simplified framework we could uh, begin to use when analyzing surveillance experience in a wide range of situations. And this is a work in progress, so I would love to hear your comments on this. Um, and I suggest that there are um, four levels of surveillance experience we could analyze. Um, and these levels are not cumulative uh, and not necessarily dependent on each other, but uh, describe different types or consequences for the individual who is being surveilled. Um, the first level of analysis, I suggest, is if or not a person knows that they are surveilled. So this is sort of a technical level. One can either notice uh, that they are under surveillance or not notice it. Surveillance can obviously be hidden. It is not always or perhaps even often possible to notice that it exists. exists. 
Mm, second level of uh, surveillance experience could be to analyze uh, if or not a person understands surveillance in terms of, for instance, who is gathering the data and for what purpose. Um, and this too is not always or even often possible and surveillance can also be understood wrongly. Also, understanding surveillance isn't necessarily connected to noticing it. Uh, rather, it can mean being able to read various places uh, and contexts and understanding where data is usually gathered and by whom and for what purpose. Um, third level we could analyze in regards to surveillance experience uh, has to do with the personal meaning given to surveillance in different places. And this meaning can also be set in uh, individual level or on societal level, um, for instance, and those two can also differ from each other. Uh, for instance, someone might think that uh, strict border control is important and is to be supported until they themselves have to wait in line for two hours when they are returning home from a holiday trip, or whatever example you want to use. Um, the last level uh, of surveillance experience we could analyze is if being under surveillance changes our actions uh, or behavior somehow. So we do, do we do something different uh, if we realize that we are under surveillance, or do we operate against surveillance in some manner? Um, and analyzing private surveillance experiences through these four levels could give us an overall idea um, of the ways and extent people notice and understand surveillance surrounding them and us, and shed light on the feelings and actions that it can also bring up. So, now I want to thank you all for this opportunity, um, and I think we have some good time for discussion and comments. I would love to hear your thoughts of being under surveillance and how you feel they fit in the frameworks that I suggested here. So, thanks very much, Lisa. And uh, so we'll just open it up to questions and comments. Um, I actually did notice, uh, first of all, thank you so much for this. Uh, but there was a moment where I realized that I had conflicting feelings about surveillance, especially with two different systems, um, Amazon and YouTube. So I kind of came to the realization that YouTube has very detailed knowledge about me because they know how much time I'm spending with the content, so they know a lot about me. Um, but also they recommend things that really are on point and I'm kind of okay with it. But at the same time, Amazon, uh, which has all these resources, keeps suggesting things that very clearly I want, like stuff I put in my own wish list or stuff that I've already bought, and I suddenly feel really violated for any information that they have because they're not giving me anything in return. And I feel like it should be a little more categorical, like either I want to be surveyed or not, but apparently not. Like, I discovered this about myself. Yeah. And it's just like... I have to be getting something in return, but if I do get something in return, I stop caring that yeah. I do surveillance. Yeah. Kind of yeah, yeah, and I think that makes it so difficult to assess the individual experience of it because it changes depending on the context and, and, and also within one context that you might, might actually be quite pleased that they, if they understand to recommend something to you that you didn't quite yet know that you need, but when you see it, you realize that this is exactly what I needed, but at the same time, there's this, uh, it's this thin line in between, yeah. like being irritated and, and being pleased. And they were like polar opposite feelings. Like I was yeah. offended when Amazon didn't give me what like, they yeah. yeah. thought I wanted. Yeah. And yeah. I was very happy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's also funny with these recommendation algorithms that as there are some things that you really seldomly buy that you only need like one. And then when you have bought it, then it starts to recommend you yeah. the same thing again and again. And yeah. So the ads that I get um, are generally really misplaced for two reasons. One, I used to work at an international internet car tech firm, so I do a lot of searches for like car websites in Hungary, and I still get ads asking me to come for a test drive tomorrow in Prague, and I'm like, no, that's not going. And I, I really enjoy the fact that I've, confused it that mm -hmm. much yeah. and it's 
Clearly they were watching, but mm -hmm. because it's so off base, mm -hmm. I don't find it as violating as I would if it was yeah. for something that I was actually interested in. Yeah. Um, and similarly, my initials are LG, and when I type them in to go to my email, I often accidentally hit enter, so I Google LG the company, so I get a lot of ads for fridges. Yeah. Which <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just uh, read about this uh, technology that you can use that sort of distorts this uh, uh, your sort of distorts your Google uh, history that it makes all these pointless yep. um, queries and then but the consequence might be that you start getting these really weird recommendations that might also you might also find that a bit annoying or um, yeah yeah How yeah. um, when we were talking about the psychological effect of surveillance on people, um, if I'm not mistaken, mistaken, I remember that there was evidence of that, of some sort of inherent sensitivity toward the idea of two eyes watching. Yeah. There were studies of uh, just drawing two eyes schematically and people changing their behavior, which showed that there is something in us probably because of our evolutionary history when we were running away from other predators in the jungle, etc., etc. And definitely that tying into surveillance of cameras and being watched will have psychological effects. Mm, definitely. My question is, are you suggesting that that element of psychological effect is somehow going to be transferred to data surveillance, which definitely does not have any idea of being watched or mm. eyes or Big Brother sort of thing, yeah. it's just data, it's yeah. algorithm, it's what you sit down in front of a computer and type in, and the surveillance that the sellers and corporates are interested in has nothing to do with my picture per se, mm. yeah. it has something to do with my decision of a black shoe or a white shoe. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's an excellent question, and data valence is it's a really tricky uh, concept in like when thinking about this because it's it's so much clearer to think about someone watching than think about various uh, systems where we without understanding it leave leave our data drops behind and I don't know maybe the main point then would be to if or not we know know it if or not we notice it and the one way that we can notice that we have left these drops would be with uh, like for instance the um, recommend they recommendations that we receive when we are buying something, but obviously that is just one segment of of the data usage. So I don't know if I have a clear answer to you. Would mm. you say that it will have the same psychological effect to the same extent? I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. Do I actually yeah. Think, I actually think it could be. Once we be, we begin to actually understand the implications, which I actually really feel like we're we're despite how much work has been done, we're really at the at very early stages of understanding that. But but to think about the granularity with which you're being watched, whether by eyes or through data collection, it's much it's the potential to be invasive is, is far greater um, than a pair of eyes, um, which will, will have a different, which can have different impacts, especially, you know, there's power imbalances that affect how I feel about certain people watching me versus other people watching me. But the, the and so that I think the more people become aware of the depth of what could possibly be going on and our, our lack of ability to know, especially in the context of, uh, of AI, so algorithmic sorting where nobody knows exactly what it's doing. Uh, I feel like that, it, you know, again, I know nothing about psychology, but it seems like it would be interesting to, to think about mm -hmm. the psychological um, impact of that. Definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How many of your participants were aware that the cameras could be hacked and did they think? that their children might be conditioned to accept the cameras more and more as they go up? Mm. Uh, I think it's safe to say that all of them knew that they could be hacked. Or It was actually interesting that uh, 
many of them had not really given a lot of thought to their system uh, before I started asking about the system. And then we had interesting discussion and many of them said that, okay, th that now I really need to think about this, this issue. Uh, uh, and the other question about the children. Mm, uh, we didn't actually discuss about that, but uh, uh, um, about what they thought that their children would think about. But we did discuss what they, the interviewers themselves thought about, and many of them said that now that they have this, that they were originally before installing the systems, they were um, a bit against surveillance in some ways. But now that they have had the system and they have seen how it works and they have found it really useful, that they are becoming more. Um, acceptable to su surveillance in uh, places beyond just their own homes, but in, in more general too. So it's quite possible that the same effect might take place with their children, but that I can only guess up on that. I don't, don't have data on that. So. Yeah. Was there a reason the age uh, factor that you chose for the research, your research more of a over no, no, I tried to uh, get people from all age categories, but I, I'm connecting it to the fact that often those people who install these kind of systems are living in houses that they own themselves, and in Finland they tend to, we tend to buy houses at, at older age. So that, I think that is one of the reasons why they were on the older side of, of people. Yeah. Also, the data is quite small that I would need to do some more. Maybe in the coming project, I will do some more interviews on this theme. We'll see. Will you be doing a project on social media surveillance? That seems to be a very interesting topic. Uh, we'll see. It's, we only started like uh, three weeks ago or something, so we're still like formulating what we want to do and what we want to focus on. But that, that's one possibility, definitely. So one of the issues yeah. that you that you touched on that obviously didn't come up in your in your group is uh, and that we're hearing a lot about in the violence against women community is the uh, is the use the, the use of home security systems for um, facilitating violence and abuse yeah. through through control including locking women in their homes yeah. and, and uh, freezing and dropping the temperature in their yeah. and their yeah. and in addition to the to monitoring and so yeah. on. Yeah. Um, and I wondered if, yeah, I know you touched on mm. it, I wondered yeah. if... No, that, that's a super fascinating topic. That's something that I would really want to examine more. And as I said that in my interviews, these kind of things didn't come up, but it's really tricky that even even though if they were were happening, I'm not sure that they would have told me, but in the that I, I briefly cited the other Finnish sociologist research, Inka Lähteenaro, it was actually her master's thesis and she studied uh, uh, smart home systems. Uh, and there, in her data, there were many examples of, of uh, things like this taking place. So taking off the electricity and taking, uh, turning the lights off in the middle of the day, which, which was framed as sort of a fun trick. But it's also there the line is, uh, is um, hard to uh, draw. So, yeah. yeah. I have one more if somebody else has yeah. One more question, prerogative of the, uh, of yeah. the moderator. Um, uh, one of the things that, that's become um, complicated, and I'm, I'm thinking of this, we, we were recently involved, involved in a Supreme Court, of, not that recently actually, almost a year ago, in a case before the Supreme Court of Canada about, about voyeurism. And, and understandings of being surveyed and being watched and the impact of that. And, and so there's this, um, and I thought it came out in your interviews too, there's this kind of idea, well, it's okay if we're not recording you in a towel. Like yeah. there are certain things usually related to toileting, yeah. sexual activity, um, nudity, uh, where there's this sense that, you know, other than that, it doesn't. It, it's it's it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think you know, going back to the point made about studies around the how even being watched impacts um, behavior or in, um, emotional integrity and so on. Um, 
it, I think it's an interesting challenge mm -hmm. to get people thinking about, well, what actually are the implications of a, of a, of a, of a routinized mm -hmm. surveillance of my otherwise so-called mundane activities? Mm -hmm. Like, what does that actually mean yeah. for autonomy? Integ bodily integrity and so on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It seemed that there was sort of this peace that they had made with themselves that that they want to have this system, but they know that there are these risks. So how do they manage those risks? They manage them by putting the camera in a place where they they can that they are not so violated if if they were filmed. But then we, I would guess that if they would find out that the, someone had accessed the the camera, they would still mind. But it's sort of this uh, this balance that they have to have to somehow create within them, like a way yeah. of, of, of justifying. Yeah, exactly. Yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Great. Or comments? Okay. Well, I want to thank, thank you. Lisa once again.